Uh, we're ch uh, we are a MySQL support consulting and development company. I have the uh, wonderful, interesting title uh, of Director of Server Development. I joined the company in May 2011. Uh, I talked about how we do like continuous integration and constant development process improvement uh, on Monday. Uh, so I'm lovely bookending the conference and this means I have to be you know, awake on a Friday. Uh, so next year if I submit anything it will be as long as it's not on Friday for like the third year in a row. Um, so this is a, a wonderful job title that basically means involved in a whole bunch of development stuff and have a whole bunch of knowledge of what's going on. I started my life in the MySQL world as a, a developer as opposed to a, a user uh, on MySQL cluster. Um, and this was way back in 2004, which is a great, interesting bit of code. Uh, I'm a core developer of the Drizzle database. Uh, one of the, I think I was the second person to land a commit in it, uh, which we started back in 2008. So I worked for Sun and Rackspace. And, uh, I have some knowledge, uh, is a modest way of putting it, of about the internals of MySQL-like database servers. Um, and I will say that I am the internals person rather than ops, like you really don't want me to be your DBA. Like seriously, no. <laughs> but uh, we have other people who do that and they do that, their job a whole lot better. Uh, so you can leave me to tell you about how the internals are going to, you know, hurt you. Uh, so. We're talking about MySQL in the cloud as a service because that's wonderful buzzword compliant and there is not one magic solution. Um, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, just works and it works absolutely perfectly. You'll get an invalid command and every, nothing will go wrong when you're running that in the cloud versus on a laptop. Um, so there's these other options which is MySQLD, uh, you know, this, that and the other. Um, feels like I should add those options to some of the distribution just to have it. It's a lot of small tweaks and then you have a whole bunch of other things you need to moderate, uh, monitor, configure and some things just aren't going to happen and it's a lovely pipe dream and oh that's nice, here's a unicorn. Um, and you know, hugs and unicorn. Uh, the greener grass may be on the other side. Uh, people will look at other you know, solutions. Uh, they may think it's like, oh well, Maybe let's go run Mongo. Oh, look, it, you need two cups of reliably still coffee. Um, people may try other things. Some other things are really useful for what they're good for. Other things are not. Uh, it turns out for a lot of things, a generic query language is a feature, um, as in the old thing of, well, let's just try this distributed map reduce function at Erlang. Um, and uh, that is obviously what you want to tell people rather than it's simple, here's a language to do it. Uh, there is a lot of legacy code out there in the wild that just relies on MySQL and a bunch of idiosyncratic in the, uh, uh, features of it, uh, is the best way to put it. Uh, and so this code still exists and we still need to import, uh, support it in some ways. So there is lots of legacy code out there for MySQL and suddenly people may want to run this in the cloud, otherwise known as we don't want to necessarily provision our own bare metal. Uh, we may want to run it in bare metal, we may want to run it in VM, we may want to dynamically scale, or we may really want to take this old app and just be able to run it in this our new wonderful private cloud or public cloud infrastructure. Um, some people come around and say there's a magic drop-in replacement. If you only buy my snake oil, it will magically make your MySQL scale in the cloud um, without a single bit of application change and it will just magically work. Um, so these people are either ignorant, um, they're talking about very specifications, spe specific applications and specific use cases, or they're liars and charlatans. Um, that's basically it. There is no one magic thing. And yes, I realize there are companies out there trying to sell these things and I've just called them liars and charlatans. That's because they are. Basically, magically having things distributed and work exactly the same, if that was all possible, we'd do it for everything and be a happy world and this you know, distributed computing thing wouldn't be hard. Uh, we'd also all have 4,096 CPUs because that's easy. Uh, so what is MySQL when I talk about it? Um, well, there's Oracle's MySQL, which was previously Sun's MySQL, which was previously MySQL MySQL. Um, so there's that sort of lineage, um, which is one thing, uh, which is interesting to note that Oracle as company policy does not play well with others. Uh, and we'll not talk, it's also company policy not to talk about not playing well with others. Uh, so there's 
problems with that, which consequently has you have a number of sort of forks or branches or distributions of MySQL around there. The first one that really got much traction was Owl Delta. Um, that sort of rolled up now into parts of MariaDB, uh, basically because even when it was an Oracle, it was uh, not necessarily Sun's policy, but at least practice and MySQL's practice, if not policy, to really not play well with others either. So there kept on being like these patches added around there. So you basically have Oracle MySQL, you have Pocono Server, which is the company I work for, so of course you should take anything I say with a grain of salt, because obviously I have a vested interest in that succeeding. Uh, so you know, uh, do take that with whatever salt you want, but obviously we're awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not a magic. It's not a magic solution for all your problems. It may just solve more and give you slightly other ones. You know, the standard thing of it's a value proposition. Uh, there is MariaDB, uh, which uh, still aims to be a drop-in replacement. Um, they have the downside of it's becoming a larger and larger delta. So how much of a drop-in replacement that it's going to be into the future is, of course, up to implementation details. Um, but that's certainly their desire. But for all intents and purposes, all these are fairly similar for what I'm talking about. right? Some have some options that are going to help. There is also a Drizzle out there, which is different. It's not sort of MySQL. It's kind of a database with common code heritage, um, the kind of the way uh, other products that forked a long time ago is. DML is mostly similar. Uh, DDL has some differences, but it's also mostly similar. Management is different. And I spoke about this in the cloud last year, so therefore it's not interesting, uh, except for you totally go and use it. Uh, I'm going to talk about database as a service. Um, so typically when I talk about database as a service, it's not like here's a VM, then you install a MySQL variant, and then you connect to it. Typically, uh, when people are doing some database as a service, uh, that means you don't get SSH to the host that runs the database server. You get a TCP port to connect to, and we magically do certain things to run a database for you. Uh, this is not, in fact, just for cloud providers, right? It's not for people who are just going to build their own giant public cloud and sell things on it. Uh, it can make sense for deploying apps internally. You may want to run like your own private cloud with some form of this. You may want to do some of these tricks like just as a shared hosting thing, uh, or it may be that you sort of have sort of some idea that you want to reduce your admin overhead or at least uh, hit people who write bad apps on the head with a stick uh, by preventing them if they ever run the queries in the first place. Um, so database as a service can be thought of something you can do internal to a company to keep yourself uh, less, oh sorry, slightly less insane uh, is the words I have written here. Uh, and also having an idea about how database as a service may work may help for people who are actually writing apps that are eventually going to be deployed here to know what your problem is going to be. So, the real easy thing to do is run bare metal because most of the uh, scaling problems and application problems and everything are known problems that with you know, some form of known solutions and a whole bunch of people with existing knowledge. So if your database as a service is an API to provisioning bare metal, this is very close to traditional hosting and tuning uh, and therefore we're done, just do that and you avoid all the problems. So thank you. <laughs> all right, um, so all is good in the world, we just all run bare metal. Unfortunately, apparently that costs money um, and some people don't want to do that. And so you start getting into the tricky idea of what do you happens when you run in sort of like, you know, a cloud, which is basically, well, you might get bare metal, you might get a VM on something, it may just be a single VM and bare metal and all those uh, wonderful things. Uh, so the next part of the talk, which is the what to do if you're not just going to run bare metal and solve it that way, uh, I was, when I was writing this, I, I had a flashback back to a talk I gave at um, OzCon, which was actually after I gave it at LCA the previous year, which was called Eat My Data, How Everybody Gets POSIX File AO Wrong. Uh, and this got the best feedback uh, I've ever gotten as a presenter, because OzCon lets you have funny text things there that you can view. And this was the comment I got uh, for that talk. A bit of a whiny bitch fest, four stars. <laughs> It's out of five, so I'm quite happy with four. I'll totally take four. So uh, I have tried and attempted not to have that too much of that ingrained in this talk, but there is a bit of that going on. Um, so I want to talk about the idea of multi-tenancy. Uh, the idea is that you have you know, more than one tenant, as in more than one you know, application on a single thing. Uh, and that thing could be you know, a physical machine, or it could be an individual database server. Um, so it's... One tenant per machine is easy. I mean, that's a solved problem. We probably all do that. Here is a provision database bare metal machine that runs one bit of application for one user, probably usually with the application logging in as root because that's always a good idea. Um, or at least a, a, a user with the privilege to do absolutely anything because you know SQL permissions are hard and it's hard. Uh, and uh, 
that's what people may think. So we want to combine that because maybe you have 10 apps that are actually small and don't do much and you don't want 10 machines sitting in a rack. You could just have one because it turns out Moore's Law helps you with that uh, and just run 10 on one. So this idea of shared hosting has had this for quite a long time. I mean, who remembers, you know, like the next to nothing dollar accounts for like, you know, PHP, MySQL web hosting and you get like an account to a MySQL server that has access to one schema. Um, and you just get sort of an account in the MySQL database. Well, this is actually, you know, the naive way to do this because it's a really bad idea. So I'm going to give you a how-to. Um, how to denial of service shared hosted MySQL. And I was chatting with uh, Josh Berkus the other day. Don't worry, it applies to Postgres as well. Um, so you know we're um, equal opportunity in this, and uh, this is the best way to actually cause it. That is. The actual implications of this, especially for MySQL, are absolutely horrific, as in recovering from it is like a nightmare, nigh impossible. Uh, start transaction with consistent snapshot is all you need to do, and then wait. Uh, so, so really realizing, what, 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 does this, what does this mean, right? I mean, well, assuming in ODB, because otherwise you're just crazy. Um, <laughs> So what happens, right? You start a consistent snapshot. You start a transaction with a consistent snapshot. That means you have a read view of the database at a certain point in time. So as long as other processes are there updating rows and inserting new rows, you have to keep undo information so that this transaction still gets its read view. So what happens? Well, you fill up your undo space in your InnoDB system table space. Then it grows the system table space. So InnoDB can do one file per table, but there is always a system table space which contains a couple of things. So what happens to the undo log? Well, it keeps growing because you still have more undo to write until it hits eno space and then everything explodes horrifically um, because you can't shrink the system table space without a whole bunch of jumping around. Uh, so good luck with that. Um, but that's not the worst thing, of course, you can do. Uh, what if you had like shared hosting with replication in there? So you could, you'd also have a read-only slave. Well. I'll tell you how to dial all services that. It's really simple. Uh, create a table, whack a whole bunch of data in it, and just continually run alter table. Like null ops alter table, because remember, MySQL replication is single threaded, so you're going to monopolize the entire time running queries, or otherwise just do large updates. Even better, do huge updates, so it takes a whole bunch of undo log time, a whole bunch of time executing in the slave, and just basically denial of services every, everything else. So shared hosting is definitely not a good idea. Multi-tenancy in the one MySQL is really not a good idea. Um, it also gives you the wonderful bits of laziness of then everyone has to write the web apps to only ever use one account to do everything because no one ever gets you know two accounts on a shared hosting thing. And you also have the old admin overhead of now you get to administer a whole bunch of MySQL user accounts as well as all your other user accounts and that doesn't really integrate with anything else. Um, or even with you know, pluggable authentication in MySQL, well that's not really useful because you have to create each specific user with what plugin they use and it just becomes... Uh, uh, job security for systems administrators who hate themselves um, uh, is the best way to put it. So what about virtual machines? They're definitely cool. I mean, they're a lot cooler than they were like 20 years ago when that was like, oh my god, Hollywood's making something funny up again. Uh, but you can use these to handle a bunch of the fundamental resource constraints that are around. Because basically, the way I see it is that running MySQL sort of as a service is not so much about, hey, set this magic things, it's more about damage control, right? You want to control the amount of damage that one tenant can do to others and the, uh, the way that VMs and uh, provisioning of things works in the cloud uh, can do to your database service. So database servers are resource hogs, right? Um, we'll have all the RAM, thank you. Yeah, you've got some, yeah, we'll have all of it. Uh, all of it. Yeah, disk, yeah, we'll have all of that too. Um, can we have more of it, thanks? Uh, more RAM, more RAM, more RAM, uh, more disk, uh, more disk, more disk. Um, so, we have to properly partition resources inside MySQL. There are going to be a bunch, they're not going to fundamentally change some of the problems in MySQL code base anytime before the heat death of the universe. Uh, that's what Drizzle is for. Uh, but to support uh, legacy apps or apps that are existing there, because really, if you think about porting your app from one language or one database server to another, can be a really bad idea because really what do you get when you just you know, rewrite something in Java? You get, just get a whole bunch of different bugs along with the old ones. Um, so it may or may not ever be a good idea. So hopefully your hypervisor helps partitioning resources. Hopefully you can at least partition static amounts of RAM for a virtual machine and that if you're 
if you're uh, using the services of another cloud provider that they in fact do that and don't overcommit. Um, hopefully you get sort of a specific amount of provision disk. Um, MySQL does not handle Eno space at all very well, so hopefully you don't also have a thinly provisioned disk that then runs out, because uh, that would be even worse. Uh, and the big thing you have to worry about is IOPS, right? Uh, you can easily partition RAM and disk space uh, between VMs. Uh, actually partitioning IOPS may or may not work depending on which hypervisor you are and it may or may not do exactly what you expect. Uh, and if you can partition all of these, this probably gets you the best isolation between multiple MySQL instances running on the same physical box. Uh, and that's ignoring the possible overhead of simply running it inside a virtual machine. Um, so I have a joke for any Americans in the room. It's IOPS, not IHOP. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah, yeah. That's much less funny in the States, even though it's funnier there. Um, <laughs> so one of the, the, the problems is, of course, uh, that we're into this stage where in uh, our infinite wisdom some point in the past, and I use the term wisdom loosely, you know, as you do for idiocy, uh, a single database transaction commit is actually multiple F-syncs. Uh, I think the last count is it's at least four. If you want crash safe replication, maybe it's four or more, depending on which database server you use. If you use older versions of MySQL, you don't actually get group commits, so that's like per thing. Uh, but there is this thing called group commit, which makes it a bit nicer, because at least then you can combine these four F-syncs. Um, uh, you can do several transactions as that. So you may have 10 transactions that commit about the same time. You can group them together and set them in one set of four F-syncs rather, rather than 10 sets of four F-syncs. It turns out the difference between like four and 40 F-syncs is quite significant. Um, there is a reason that I wrote a shared library called libeatmydata. Uh, everyone should run eatmydata uh, that removes the wonderful bits of crash safety from their apps um, or durability. So that's a great thing and I wrote that because like testing the database server, F-syncs are really, really slow. They're really, really slow on your laptop, especially when we had spinning rust, but they're, you, know, you still have unpredictability in the cloud. So just removing F-syncs makes things run so much faster. So basically, you can do anything you want as long as you save F-syncs. Uh, so group commit. Uh, MariaDB has uh, an implementation out there that's pretty cool. Uh, so this basically means you can commit things together and you get a whole bunch of performance improvements. They have their own benchmarks. I encourage you to run your own because, uh, you know, Seeing people who make the software make the benchmarks always goes in here. Uh, that being said, we publish a lot of our own benchmarks too. Uh, but uh, I encourage people to run their own benchmarks uh, correctly rather than incorrectly too. Uh, it's amazing what you can do when you set things wrongly. Uh, Percona server also has group commit. Uh, we imported the MariaDB patch. Um, so we have a group commit patch in there. I think possibly, I'm going to just ask her because I don't remember, may actually have an Oracle implementation in 5.6. So, you know, by the time anyone packages 5.6 and anyone upgrades to it uh, in a few years' time, uh, perhaps you'll have group commit there too. Uh, and this will possibly also increase the number of tenants per machine, because at least then you're doing fewer F-Sync, so you can run more database servers there, because your primary resource constraint is going to actually be IOPS, uh, no matter what. Uh, if you're going to do uh, MySQL in the, you know, in the cloud or as a service, um, Unlike drugs, uh, my, my ism, just say no, will actually work because it will only ever cause you good things and everyone should follow that. Uh, my ism isn't crash safe, it's not durable, uh, replication is problematic with it, it's not high performance, that is a lie from the days of single processor machines uh, and it's essentially dead, right? Uh, anyone who developed my ISAM, uh, is not working at Oracle. Oracle has no interest in maintaining that. Really, the only reason my eyes are still on the server is because it's used for temporary tables and all the system tables and refactoring the code to do system tables into something other than my eyes am is kind of like taking your eyes out with a spoon. Uh, kind of annoying. So it's going to take a while at some point. I would not be surprised if there was a mode to just disable it and it's gone in a future version. So just say no to my eyes am. Uh, if someone says, but we have full text indexes, obviously you don't care about performance because that's just horrific. Uh, and there's other solutions that are better. And anyway, you know, DB is going to have that in 5.6 anyway. So your problem solved. Um, I haven't seen any patches from them to do anything with it. Well, they're changing it to ARIA, so... Yeah, they're changing it to ARIA, but that's been the story for six years, so... <laughs> the default engine for creation is in ADV. Mm. In 5.5 and up, yeah. 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 
Yeah, I, I hesitate to say I, I think ARIA will be default in, in MariaDB or be functional and usable in, in MariaDB for roughly the time Duke Nukem Forever is released. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like that happened now. It completely spoiled the joke. So I'm not quite sure. So I'm going to say shortly after World Peace. Uh, I think I'm safe with that one. Uh, but really, I wish I got World Peace instead of Duke Nukem Forever. So, Half-Life 3, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, I know always the next version of Windows seems to take forever, so you know we could make that joke too. Um, but always just use InnoDB. Uh, this is much, pretty much what you should enforce. For one thing, you have crash recovery. So of course, uh, hardware is getting way more reliable and way more cheaper to get more reliable, right? No, it's getting less reliable and cheaper at the same time. And now it's like, oh, cloud, good, we can provision a whole bunch of unreliable machines if they don't. If they go down, we don't care. So you want something that has some kind of crash safety. And this is ignoring the current open bugs that uh, mean that you don't actually have crash safety in, in <laughs> some bits um, that have been there for a long time. Um, so one thing, of course, if you're running database as a service, like doing my ISM recovery for people and running recovery and attempting to rescue their tables and waiting the four days to run a consistency check on large enough tables is going to be a support nightmare. I mean, really, it's because you're lost of money in running support. So set the default engine to InnoDB. Um, in Picona Server, we have an option which is uh, Enforce Storage Engine, um, which does lovely things because uh, it gives you an error. So MySQL has this idea of SQL modes, uh, which is roughly the way of to cause application developers headaches uh, is the best way to describe that. So, you know, sorry, but there they are. If the no engine substitution SQL mode is enabled, uh, if you have enforced storage engine set and someone explicitly asks for another storage engine, it, they will get an error. So you say you cannot create a table with my ISAM. And if you have uh, enforce uh, no engine substitution disabled, you'll get a warning. So you can basically make people sort of magically use InnoDB by setting enforced storage engine to InnoDB and the default SQL mode to something with uh, no, edge, no engine substitution enabled. But if they really want to do something stupid, and you can say, we won't support you in this case, you can, they can, in fact, go and create a MyISM table. Um, so that's a pretty cool little feature. Um, I'm not aware of anyone else having picked up that patch, uh, because the MySQL server variance landscape is wonderfully fragmented uh, without sort of a central point that would be considered upstream or common patch corollaries. So um, as users, I'm sure you're all happy about that. Eno space. Uh, never, ever, 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 ever hit Eno space with MySQL. Um, uh, remember the denial of service thing with uh, 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 that? Well, it gets worse. Um, if you have bin logs for replication, you don't have the right server options enabled, well, you may get a transaction like managed to get into the NODB logs, but not into the bin logs. Um, you may suddenly hit Eno space with weird temporary files. You may just like alter table, explode in the middle. Um, and so how do you prevent this? One of the things is if you're running, uh, you know, this is a service, you basically never want to hit Eno space. So you basically want to make it very, very hard for someone to ever hit Eno space. So how can you do this? Um, one of the interesting ways is to just use InnoDB with file per table. Uh, so you can have less things suddenly growing the system table space to something huge. Um, that's a good way to do things. You can just monitor free disk space using standard tools such as DF, um, which I believe will work on everything but any file system that does transparent compression and snapshots and the like. Um, but that's, you know, don't do that. Use XFS. There is no other file system for running databases on. Use XFS. No one's contradicting me. Brilliant. Because uh, everything else is slow and abysmal. Uh, yeah, XFS basically gets out of the way. Uh, and doesn't have very many global contention points in the file system. So we can actually just do a whole bunch more concurrent I.O. and direct I.O. and it just sort of does, it's giving you names to things in a, uh, in a file system and that's about it. Uh, fragmentation. Fragmentation. Fragmentation will also hurt you a bit. Uh, there are some things that help with that, like the way uh, InnoDB sort of extends files, if you make that a bit larger, it becomes less of a worse problem. There is the other problem of fragmentation inside InnoDB table spaces. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, that's something that can't really be avoided now. Uh, so with Extra Backup, which is uh, the open source uh, online backup tool for InnoDB, uh, Oracle has one that's proprietary. Um, 
and everyone else uses extra backup. We thought at some point could we do something with that. Um, there are some tricky things to do in there because it turns out that people always want their backups to work, so that's always priority one. And then people, when you're doing something tricky dicky with the InnoDB data files, people still want their data back there. So it becomes a very much of you know intense thing to making sure it's always going to work. So there may be something in the future, but you know we're talking at least a year off before we consider sketching out in a whiteboard how to do it. Uh, and you know, once you know how to do something, then to actually doing it is always two weeks, right? <laughs> so uh, we'll see that. Uh, the other thing you could do to prevent Eno space is do statically allocated InnoDB table spaces. So you can actually tell an InnoDB configuration, hey, just create a one terabyte table space and be done with it, and don't let people allocate over that. Um, that has the other issue of uh, that is that this space will be reserved for InnoDB only and InnoDB itself. Uh, it has other issues you can't then sort of unhook the table space and do some InnoDB tricks there. It has the disadvantage of you now get different error messages when you run out of space in your InnoDB table space. Um, and I would not bet that those code paths are tested um, uh, at all. Uh, I would not run those code paths. I'd do file per table and let it organically grow because that's what the vast majority of people run and that will be what has actually seen stuff in that in the wild. There are, part, there are decent sized parts of MySQL Server and InnoDB that are tested by your gracious selves, the users of our software, um, in production, because that's where you test it. Uh, yeah, so there is, the, for the, just a scary thing, the only open source InnoDB crash test thing, the first one of that came out of Facebook, right? For, for crash testing of InnoDB. So, uh, that's kind of like Oracle says, here it is, it magically works. How can we verify it? Good luck with that. Um, so those code files, especially of statically indicated data files, I personally, I wouldn't exercise them, but uh, feel free to. Uh, I'm sure that will be uh, great to have in a support contract that that must work. Um, so the idea is that basically the best thing seems to be run in ODB file per table and monitor for how much disk space is left. And do the monitoring way, it's not kind of like, oh, am I nearly running out? But you know, project at how much disk usage goes up to when you're gonna fill up the disk. The InnoDB uh, undo log, uh, so contraction, con uh, transactions get a consistent read view. Um, well, of course, you can't purge the old rows, or for anyone's familiar with Postgres, letting you vacuum uh, the old stuff up uh, until that transaction's done. Right? So keeping old transactions running can be quite bad. There is currently no magical feature to limit how much uh, undo log can use on disk. Uh, that would be a great feature. Um, if anyone wants to sponsor that development of it, uh, talk to me. Um, we can tell you roughly how much it'll cost and you know, that'll be great and everyone will be love you forever. Um, but you can't currently limit that. It's kind of like unbounds uh, growing. Um, and this is sort of a wonderful disconnect in the database world between academic awesomeness and the practicalities of running a database server. There's these wonderful two worlds of like this wonderful academic bar and then someone's like, I have to run this and support it. Uh, so there's two wonderful conflicting worlds there, uh, which is hilarious if you're the person having to run it. Uh, so there's this other feature we have, uh, which is called kill idle transactions, which is at least in the, the Facebook patch set and Picona server. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, transactions that are sitting there doing nothing for some period of time, just come in and kill them. Uh, so therefore, if you have a transaction that's left over by some app carelessly with the old read view and maybe some locks held, row locks especially, uh, row locks are another good contention point that can get you in trouble on apps, uh, it'll just kill them off and then you'll be able to run purge and the like for get rid of the old rows and you know undo space gets cleaned up. Uh, this doesn't help with non-idle transactions. So this kill idle transactions would help with the denial of service attack of a start transaction with consistent snapshot and just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, idle transactions, kill idle transactions won't help if you do something horrific like do small updates all the time or run small queries every so often. Uh, so if someone, which is more like someone being evil or a particular form of nasty bug rather than someone just being careless and forgetting to close a connection. Um, the other way is to write a script yourself. Uh, that simply looks at the age of any connection, and if it's too old, just kill it. Sorry, you've been running too long. Five minutes is the maximum amount of time you have. You're gone. Uh, that's fairly easy and could be done with, you know, a bit of Perl, a bit of shell. You could probably do it in a stored procedure, an SQL 2003 stored procedure in the database server if you're feeling particularly masochistic that day. Um, but, you know, that's a pretty simple thing to do as well. Um, world of hurt with bin logs and Eno space. Um, so of course you have bin logs that rotate for doing replication, because odds are if you're doing MySQL at some point, you're either going to want the 
uh, replication logs or bin logs because it's a binary format as opposed to the text format and somehow we've stuck with bin log as a term instead of like replication log or something sensible because it's awfully important that you're in the know to understand what's going on. Um, this would hurt if you Eni space uh, with bin logs. I mean, you know, we have sort of a group commit and two phase. Some uh, MySQL distributions do have two phase commit going on between InnoDB and the bin log, so that you can actually do crash recovery where you get back the state of your transactions in InnoDB and the state of transactions in the log for replication to be the same. Um, if they're different, of course, that means you may replicate a transaction that is not actually stored on the master, or you may have a transaction on the master that's not actually replicated around crash, uh, uh, crash recovery. Uh, and that would be a bad thing, so don't hit Eno space or bin logs, because I can tell you now, those code paths inside the MySQL server are not tested. Like, good luck if they work. They're definitely not. Uh, they're not gonna uh, be tested at all. Uh, because the best thing you can do if you ever want to find bugs in software, fill up the disk and attempt to use it at all. None of your software works, by the way. <laughs> like if you ever had on a laptop, you know, none of it works. Even better if you run out of inodes. But um, it's a great way of finding bugs in software. Um, there is a parameter called max bin log size, and you think that's brilliant. I'll just set this MySQL server parameter; it will solve all my problems for the amount of disk space used by uh, bin log. So if I could just, you know, limit how much InnoDB uses and limits the bin log usage, and then I can make sure users never hit Eno space. That's just the size of an individual file. Um, so this is basically a workaround for the downfalls of ext3 and how unlink performance is horrific uh, and is very interrupting. So basically, that's all that's useful for. And for systems that couldn't have files more than two gigabytes, it's also useful for. Uh, and apart from that, it's not. Uh, and of course, we can't actually front truncate the log or rotate it, so it's in effect how big individual the size can get. Uh, in Bacona Server, we have a patch for max bin log files. So then you can specify uh, the max, maximum bin log, so, bin log size, could be a gigabyte. You set max bin log files to 20, and the absolute maximum amount of disk space that uh, the bin log could take up would then for be, you know, 20 times 10, you know, or two times, yeah, so much disk space. Uh, the server rotates the bin log files, so the old ones fall off the back end uh, when you get to max bin log files, uh, or you have max bin log age, so you know you keep a week's worth, uh, which is an existing option in the MySQL server. Of course, you can do an awful lot of transactions in a week, uh, which is not a disk space limit, that's a time limit. Uh, the server does rotate the bin log files under the conditions, so this, you know, max bin log files times max bin log size is an upper limit rather than a constant limit. Uh, there are other files, uh, temporary files that the MySQL server uses that's going to cause you trouble. Uh, many types of temporary files. There are temporary files that are done during query execution. There is file sort temporary files. There is temporary files to do with alter table. There are temporary files and explicit temporary tables that you may create inside transactions. Uh, and there are temporary files as part of replication. Uh, so the most little known bit of, of foo uh, is the fact that the MySQL replication logs, the bin log there, only ever has things written to it that is committed. So during transact, so if you start a transaction and start doing updates, those updates are actually stored in a memory buffer until it gets to uh, the server option of bin log cache size, which by default is 32K. Uh, if it gets to 30K, it then writes that to a temporary file on disk and streams it out there. And then at the end, when you commit the transaction, if you can imagine, you can actually do a fair amount of updates now. Um, especially if you're doing uh, row-based binary locking. Uh, so if you're doing the reliable, as in the possible to ever get correct, uh, ignoring the code, uh, row-based logging, uh, you can get pretty much more than 32K by you know, updating a single blob or inserting a single blob, right? So then you write a temporary file on disk, you then go back to the start of that, read it out, and then write it out to the bin log and unlink the temp file. So you start actually doing a lot of metadata operations in your file system at the same time, which only helps performance, because uh, that has more synchronous operations to the disk, as well as you should not ever assume that all your temporary files end up in slash temp, because uh, they don't, uh, but also slash temp is where some things go, and they're not always, always on, uh, not always on disk, they can be unlinked, so you know the wonderful thing of an unlinked file that's still open that uses up your disk space, and you're like, LS, there's no files there, how is the file system full? That can also cause you headaches with this, so good luck with that. Um, so, there's been long answer things of perhaps we should actually just not unlink the file, so at least, you know, the sysadmin is in page at four o'clock in the morning with, oh my God, it stopped working, can have some hope of finding out that that's in fact what's going on. Um, 
So users and groups and stuff uh, is a pretty interesting problem as well. Uh, you may want to give uh, people control of your database as a service, the ability to create users uh, and set up their own uh, authentication users and uh, users in the, in the database server. Um, if you're like just giving people a VM with it pre-installed, I mean you can do that pretty safely. Just you know, give them root and be done with it. Um, you can also probably want to give people who are giving the database as a service to, here's a MySQL instance, you may want to give them sort of the root ability on MySQL, that could be an option you could have. Um, the only problem with that of course is password recovery, because it turns out no matter how much you insist people do actually store their password safely, they don't. Uh, and so recovering the root password and setting a new root password in MySQL instance of course involves some foo. Um, password recovery for root is something you may want. Uh, there is the Amazon approach, uh, so Amazon run like a uh, relational database as a service of which no one has ever seen what source code is there. So it's some version of MySQL with some arbitrary patches as a service um, that uh, I don't see anyone who's ever seen the code for that and who doesn't work for Amazon. So good luck with that. Um, they enforce an API instead of using like grant and revoke and all SQL things. So you'd have, if your application does that at all, you'd have to go and change it to use their API calls. And that's one way to do it. You then have a whole API infrastructure if you're if you're developing a cloud thing, then you can have your own API from structure to do that. Uh, and then you could have just a local daemon that does manual foo, or you have some other user for that too. Uh, at the risk of like blowing our own product's trumpet too much, uh, we have a feature in Pagona Server uh, that has something called a utility user. And this is the idea is that uh, as a cloud provider, you would have like this user to connect to, not actual root. The idea is that as a cloud provider, you should not have access to everyone's data all of the time. Uh, you just sort of provision this and then sort of let them have their own data in their own space and deal with their own problems. But you can still do password recovery. So the utility user is like a bunch of command line options that means that the, it's a user that cannot be dropped, it's a user that is barely seen, and it's a user that can only access specific schemas like the MySQL schema to then do password reset. Uh, so it has root-like qualities in some ways, but in other ways is very restricted. Uh, so it doesn't really exist and it's not really deleted and it's a wonderful little utility for being able to do password reset without having root access to that box or having to log into the VM as root and then do other horrible things to it. So you could actually exist as a, My uh, as a cloud provider, give people MySQL as a service without ever having root log into the VM or the MySQL server and that's like pretty neat. Uh, replication is its uh, own set of problems. Standard awkwardness applies. Uh, there is a bunch of stuff you shouldn't do to uh, break MySQL replication. This is a relatively known set of do's and don'ts. I say relatively known, like there's you know, articles and piece out there. Standard awkwardness applies, so don't break it. Uh, you know, long running things are still going to cause you problems. Statement based has some problems, row based has other problems. Uh, none of those problems magically go away in a cloud. Uh, Backup uh, is also useful for bootstrapping slaves and also for, well, backup um, and, you know, accidental drop table and delete all the rows and such things. Uh, MySQL dump is your SQL dump. It's great, bad for big data because, well, it holds a long running read view for a very long time, so that's not good. Undo space grows during backup. It takes a long time to restore. Recreating indexes is not a cheap operation. Uh, and of course, unless you give it the exact correct incantation, your blobs are going to be corrupt. Um, extra backup is also good. Online backup for NoDB, pretty good. Uh, you probably want to hide all the details from people. Um, else, unfortunately, it's not always hugely uh, obvious to users of what to do and don't with it. So you could just have an API that automatically takes a backup and do that, or you just run it in a cron job or something. Um, of course, if you're, you were going to need free space on the machine, free disk space on the machine to store the backup or to stream it to somewhere else. Um, so that's fun. Good luck with that. It's Eno space management again. So maybe even have a separate you know, block device you attach to store a backup or to stream it directly out to somewhere else is the other ways to do that. Um, and of course, also spawn slaves for scale out and all that kind of things. And of course, how much control to give replication users. And for some reason, I have a bug in my presentation. But we can wonder why that doesn't work later. Good luck <laughs> is, is basically the whole thing. It, it really is good luck. And um, pinpoint presentation software is great because you can actually just switch to Emacs and fix your presentation while it's running and it jumps to the slide. <laughs> so uh, that's great. So I say good luck. There is a bunch of caveats here. So feel free to ask me questions. We have like five minutes or one minute, depending on whose clock you believe, and I'll attempt to answer in a way that doesn't make you cry in the corner. And we have a microphone -y thing.
So um, I'm one of those sysadmins that gets the call at four o'clock in the morning when the developer's done something silly and filled the disk. Yep. Um, we use uh, the Amazon Relational Database Service for our cloud SQL infrastructure. Now, you sort of touched on that you, you, they don't release the source code yep. and you do, we don't really quite know how that runs. However, mm. I'm, obviously you, your allegiances lie with your company, but what is your opinion on that service that is provided? Brilliant because it takes a whole bunch of headaches away from people and it's a really simple way to say, oh, I just need a database server somewhere, What's well, you can just pay them and it works fairly well. Um, so that's a bit of brilliant. There's some inflexibility you get with that, of course, as you may be aware of like how the replication works and how to do users and stuff. So there's a bunch of limitations there. But I mean, worst case scenario, you can still SQL dump your data out and move it somewhere else. So they do have a, a, there is a way to get your stuff out fairly well. And it is, you're somewhat under their mercy and that will be the case for a lot of places. I mean, one, thing that is a continued problem is how do you do version upgrades for if you hit a bug in MySQL that is a incorrect query result and you need to run that query and it's only fixed in the new version, doing an upgrade is a yeah, unsolved well, problem in this well, kind of space. Obviously Amazon lock you into a specific point version and say this is what you get and then that's yeah, it. But yeah, and then you get to slave something awful. Um, so yeah, that serves apart from great, but you know, you don't get the source code, you have other limitations there, so that's of course something to consider. But a lot of people run it for very large sites successfully. And it's also the great thing of, you know, then I'm not running it, someone else is, which I am all for, for a bunch of things. Do your core business, outsource everything else. G'day. G'day. Uh, <laughs> the max bin log days and max um, bin, bin log, log count, whatever it is. Count, whatever yeah. they are. Do they take into account um, whether or not a slave requires those logs no. to replicate? No. no. So that's a good way to kill slaves? Um, so if you have slaves lagging behind too far, then yeah, but odds are if they're lagging behind too far, they're probably offline and you shouldn't be querying them for old data anyway. So arguably they're already broken. So but if you are doing the, the thing where you lag slaves, so you do the intentional slave is one day behind, you probably want to make sure that you have at least a day's worth of logs, um, which is of course problematic if you're doing bin log size as opposed to bin log time. Right, you kind yeah. of need both. Yeah, you may... How do they you, interact if you set both? If you set both, then it does it, uh, whichever causes it to expire makes it expire. So it, it's literally, you have two routines there, check if it's older than whatever, if, then it will expire, I'll check if you know, there's a number of files adds up to the size or expire. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, just to, wanted to uh, ask about, you know, like... Um, uh, I was imagining maybe you might talk about uh, um, uh, 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 automatic uh, scaling or something like that. But oh, yeah. that's, that, that, that that's comes in under the, the, uh, the magic wish. That's the liars and charlatans slide. Um, anyway, offer it to be magic is like you know, either telling you a fib very convincingly because some of them are, or uh, yeah. Which is unfortunate. It's just like doesn't seem to be magic. For some apps, yes, it is magic. Like um, some things do really well for key lookups. It turns out that some people run SQL queries that aren't simple key lookups, and there it falls apart. And that's ignoring correctness. Um, so you know you want the same results uh, in reasonable time, uh, which is harder than it, it is for harder than it looks for these magic scaling solutions. So, as the developer of an application that I'd love to, you know, send to the cloud, because that seems to be where all the money is, um, <laughs> um, and um, what, what advice would you give on things not to, to, to really avoid early, but rather than have really fall over later? What things should I be thinking about early on in terms of how we, you know, design Samba and, you know, I want to put Samba AD in the cloud. Yeah. Um, what, is it, any particular things you think? I, I mean, Eno space seems like I'm looking for a world of pain in there. But yeah, um, any other sort yeah. Of I mean, there? if you're running another app that you're looking to put in there, we see Eno space is always a problem. Uh, competition for disk is always an issue. So, like, if you actually ever have to wait for a disk to sync, um, that latency can spike. And it's not so much, uh, you know, oh well, we get pretty good stuff. It's like the the spikes that can really hurt. Um, so we refer to this as like jitter and transaction throughput um, because of course you know transactions wait for commit and um, there's actually a variety of different 
uh, blog post that uh, Vadim's done on like our MySQL performance blog of like, well, certain thing in cloud or certain product that does something or certain versions of InnoDB of like how much do you have? So if you have application response times, it's usually you know, a web page loading for a user or you know, in the case of Sam, maybe someone logging in, uh, you know, it's like, you know, the more number of times out of 10 that it's within the margin, the better. And so it's not so much always guarantee, it's kind of like, you know, well, if you have nine times out of 10 is good, but you know, 90 times, 99 times out of 100 is better and stuff like that. And you try and reduce the outliers. Um, so it's more stuff, I'd say, of uh, try not to ever rely on disk things happening. Always have an easy way to do online backup and cloning out to something else and recovery. Um, which, you know, the clustering sample stuff is easier. Um, but also, you know, space is kind of thing that's pretty thin. That can be a sort of limiting thing of, of disk space in there for people, mainly because then they just think it's the magic cloud and don't look at it. Um, and the same thing for memory. It's kind of like th these interesting corner cases around there. But usually it comes down to also simpler administration of like if it can be more hands off, the better. You know, as well as like having things like maybe utility user for people who are maybe offering this as a service to like still, hey, that's all yours, but we can you know reset password if you if you call us. Um, we're thinking the same thing of like encrypted backups and the like. How you would possibly do that to be able to have here store your backup encrypted in the cloud, but we can recover it. You know, if go to our vault and recover a secondary key with or stuff like that is other thoughts for future. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have. I'm sure Stuart will be around in the hall. Yeah. If, if you have any more questions, just come outside and I'll stand around in a shirt that looks like an organizer. Thank you very fine. much, Stuart. Thank you. Cool. I'll get out of the way and this time not forget my paradactor like I did on Monday. Cool. Do you have the clinical? I don't have one. Then we're in trouble. Does anybody have the Thunderbolt to team uh, VGA wrap? Did it go missing? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff underneath the signs there. Yeah, I think everything is gone. We have one. Excellent. I'm sorry. Someone gets a microphone. Come on up. The yeah, you could okay. use this. Um, I can give you a stick mic, but I'll need that for the questions. Okay. Uh, we can use this and... Do you, do you want this one and I'll take this one? Or do you want that one and I take this one? You can take that one. Okay. Um, is it set for one circle for some six days? Hello. Do I just clip this on my, on my collar here? Is it displaying? I think that the problem I put out is on my computer. Uh, this is what I should do. I'll talk to laptop so it's five minutes faster. So oh, okay. could you be on track with my laptop? Let's put the time for the start. Oh, no, but these people are just out of the room. Right. I've got 11.30 right now. Yeah, it's 11.30 now. That's what I've got. Exactly. Black are out of sync. So then you guys have 11.35? Yes. Yeah. So that's where I stay. Yeah, it's 11.30 okay. now. So, so it's all right. Yeah. All right. Um, it's something. Uh, yeah, what should I be? One zero two four seven six eight. But I don't think it's being detected. Doesn't detect that it's not detecting. Oh, it's not detecting. 
Although when you plug it in, it wouldn't blink for a second. So you did that. I think something was happening. No devices detected. Now we have that. This is we're missing a uh, power mic from number uh, four. We haven't seen it. No, we haven't gone this way. We we only have one here, but we've got maybe. Also, I don't know if. Is my is my dial in? Can people hear me right now? I don't know. I don't know. What are you here? I'm having a screen problem. Hello. Okay, so. Alright. Oh, crap. Here, we got a different uh, adapter. Let's try that. Actual Apple branded one. Should just go to. Yeah. It's not even. So we click on the other yeah. ones that wouldn't care about. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go go up to that. There. So, What's up? I think it's up there right there. No, no, no. It won't stop. Well, like right now it's up there. Yeah. Oh, so it should still have it? Oh, just click that. Yes, just strong. What resolution is that? Can you tell me? Uh, it needs to be taken.